Thanks for joining our training session on Lead Nurture. Um, we're going to give the rest of the attendees just a few moments to join and settle, and then we'll be right back with you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone again for joining today. Um, we're going to be focusing on how to implement a life cycle nurture journey, um, which mostly focuses on how to engage contacts that have expressed interest in your brand and drive them towards requesting a demo, submitting a free trial, a one-on-one -on -one session, basically taking them from interest to evaluation and driving them through that conversion funnel. So this is one of two training webinars that we have here at Autopilot that we have on the customer success side. Um, training 101 is focused more on the basics of setting up your account, where this one is more focused on a deeper dive into journey creation. So we'll send through a link to the first for everyone attending just in case you haven't joined this already. Um, but just to be clear, today is more focused on implementation and marketing best practices um, around lead nurture. So a little bit about who we are. My name is Hadley Childs. I am a Senior Success Manager here at Autopilot. Um, I've been here going on three years now, which is crazy to say. Um, but my focus has always been on strategy and implementation, helping customers get up and running on the platform. Um, and today I'm just going to share some of those tips and tricks that I've learned from working with uh, different use cases and products and, and all of the different industries um, from my time here at Autopilot. Uh, and I'll let Eloise come in and, and introduce herself now. Great. So hi guys, my name is Eloise Shuttleworth. Um, alongside Hadley, I'm also a customer success manager here at Autopilot. I have a pretty strong background in loyalty marketing, um, so I'm very much aware of the kind of common frustrations with standard marketing practices, um, and super excited to be taking you through this lead nurture journey creation uh, today with Hadley. Awesome. So just a quick high level of what we'll actually be going through today. Um, we're going to focus on the whys behind the life cycle nurture journey and some of the foundational steps of actually getting this journey live. Um, this includes, you know, who are we building this for, what are we going to send them, and, and just kind of the ins and outs of getting this done. And then we'll be spending most of our time actually in the platform to start building this journey together. Um, all the while through these, uh, through the actual building process, you know, going through best practices and, and tips that you can leverage to get this up and running for your team. Um, and then it's always really important to understand the goal of the journey and what we're actually driving them towards. Um, so we're going to cover success metrics and what you should be reviewing to optimize and build on this journey um, so you know what to go for and what to look at. Um, and then this is meant to be a valuable session for all of you guys attending, and we really do appreciate your time. So we want to make sure that we're spending uh, some, some time at the end actually answering questions. And you can go ahead and answer, enter these questions here within the GoToWebinar panel. Um, so please, throughout the session, add these in. We'll get to them towards the end, um, but uh, please do add them in there so that we have something to talk about and, and can get those <laughs> answered. <laughs> So we're going to go ahead and, and dive in here. 
Um, so here at Autopilot, we believe in an acquire, nurture, grow framework, which we do like to go through at the start of most of our training sessions. Um, the reason we do this is because we really want to reinforce the importance of thinking through the customer life cycle as a whole um, and where the different journeys that we create fit in. Um, we go through this framework a little bit more in depth within that training 101 session that I mentioned earlier, um, and we cover what are the goals of each of the stages, what are some customer examples, um, so we do deep dive on this a little bit. Um, but today we're really going to focus on a high-level overview of this framework. Um, and specifically this nurture stage here. So uh, our goal is to take strangers that are coming to our site, turn them into leads, and, and ultimately engage with them to convert them to a customer. Um, from there, we want to continue to support these customers so we can grow these accounts and just really generate long-term value for our company. Um, and we've already acquired these leads through different events and webinars, trade shows, white papers organic and paid searches, and I can keep going and going and going. Um, but now we want to say, okay, what do we do with these people once we bring them in uh, if they weren't ready necessarily to buy at that time? So this is where nurturing fits in. So as I was alluding to, uh, only about 25% of leads are actually ready to buy when they first connect with your brand. So that means that 75% of all the leads coming in through you know, the different methods that I mentioned or engaging with your product or submitting forms, et cetera, um, these users are all interested in, in buying, but they might not be interested in actually buying that particular day. Um, so creating this journey to nurture these contacts is key. Um, so we're continuing to, to, to educate them on the value of your brand um, so they know where to go when it is time to make that buying decision. Uh, and this is where we kind of enter in the autopilot nurture machine and, and what we're going to be building uh, in together today. Um, so here at Autopilot, we have implemented our own lifecycle nurture journey that's engaging with these contacts. And we've seen about 10% of our new trials coming from this journey. Um, and the machine is, is just always constantly running for us in the back end and resurfacing opportunities from these contacts. Um, so it's always, it's like a hidden sales team member that's uh, looking for new deals that we can close that month. So um, it's a really valuable source for us to, to generate, um, you know, the, the, the trials that lead to the customers, that lead to just growing and working with those customers over time. So before we actually start building this journey, uh, we're going to cover some of the questions that I really recommend just sitting down and asking yourself before you start to implement. So defining your audience. The first step to building the nurture machine is to think through your customer's journey as it stands today. So, you know, how we define, and I'm going to go into a little bit of an official definition here, but the customer journey is defined as the chronological set of learning, decisions, uh, and touch points that a person experiences as they first get to know your company, hopefully become a customer, and eventually uh, become a repeat buyer and refer. So depending on what type of company you are, um, there's a different process that that customer is going to go through or a different you know, customer life cycle that's unique, unique to your type of business. Um, so whether you're a tech startup with a freemium model or an e-commerce site um, or uh, a consulting firm that's selling services, your customer is on a journey that you want to make sure that you're guiding and, and driving them towards you know, what's going to be the most valuable for them. So for any of our inside sales customers on the line, you know, you're looking to generate qualified leads that you can send through to your sales team. Um, maybe if you have a freemium model, your focus is more on getting these users to sign up for that free model to then cross a certain threshold and, and then become a paying customer. Um, if you're an e-commerce brand, you're focusing on you know, getting visitors to your site. How can I recapture those that have abandoned their cart? Um, and really just overall bringing these customers back over time so we can get them to become that repeat buyer. Consultants, I don't leave you guys out here as well. So we want to show you what that you want to really show that your intellectual value is high so um, that you can then generate referrals when you've demonstrated that value. Those referrals lead to calls. Those calls lead to sales. So it's all ways that it all kind of ties together to take someone from, from being a stranger on your site, bringing them in, and, and getting them to be a customer. Um, so defining what's really important here and, and how your how your customer journey looks today 
is really going to help you define the best messaging and framework for the journey that we're going to go ahead and build. But first, let's talk for personas. Um, so we now have an understanding of what our customer's journey is. So we want to start to think about who is the end customer that we're, or the end prospect that we're messaging to. Um, so here, there's just uh, some key questions that we want to, to ask ourselves. So, you know, where do customers hang out and, and where are they getting their information? Is it Google? Is it social media? You know, what is their source of truth? Um, what are their needs and, and what's important to them? Uh, and also, you know, what is their current environment and setup today? What are the tools and, and what they, that they use and, and that they've already integrated? Um, so all of these questions will really give us a good understanding of who we're writing this content for, who's going to be added to this journey, what that process looks like, um, because we don't want to treat everyone the same and we really want to speak to them uh, in terms that they understand. So now that we have an idea of, of what the customer experience is, we know who we're talking with, uh, we're actually going to start jumping into autopilot and building some things together. So um, this is where I'm going to let Eloise come back in and, and start to speak through what we'll actually go through now. Awesome. So we are going to dive in autopilot now to actually show you how you can start to build out these journeys in your instance. Um, but three of the main things that I'll cover in kind of the next five to ten minutes. Um, first is how you actually go about capturing these leads from different sources. Um, the second is once you've captured them, how do you qualify your leads through condition checks in autopilot so that you know that you're targeting the correct audience for your lead nurture journey. And then last but not least, I'll show you how you can add those contacts to a nurture journey list so that they can be triggered into the actual lead nurture journey when we go and build it uh, in a few moments time towards the, uh, towards the latter stages of this call. Perfect, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen with you. Let me just jump into my autopilot account. So as Hadley's covered already today, the goal of the lead nurture journey is to take those leads that are hitting your site and marketing materials and nurture them to that point in their life cycle at which they're ready to purchase or sign up for a free trial in our case. Um, now, here at Autopilot, we actually like to put all of our leads through an initial qualification journey before they're triggered into that lead nurture journey so that we know that we're only communicating to those that truly qualify. And this is where sort of defining your audience, setting up your goals, um, and really targeting those key personas comes into play. And then we use this journey to make sure that only those key personas uh, and audience uh, that meets our criteria are actually falling into that journey. So as a first step today, I thought that uh, we would show you exactly how you can build out a similar qualification journey in your platform. Um, so I am, as you can see now, in a uh, lead qualification journey within my own autopilot instance. Now, the one thing to keep in mind as we're going through this journey is that whilst we are calling it a qualification journey today, there are a number of key principles and shapes that will go through uh, that will probably be applicable to a number of operational journeys that you're doing in your own instance and at your own end. Uh, a couple that come to mind are, are field update journeys, contact segmentation, uh, and even list cleanups, if that's something that, uh, that you do regularly. So the first thing that I've done for my lead qualification journey here is that I've added um, a number of trigger shapes to my canvas, including a form submitter trigger, a smart segment trigger, and a list trigger. Um, now, a common question that I get asked by a lot of my customers is, can I add multiple triggers to my canvas? And the answer is yes, absolutely, um, as we're doing here today. And you may very well find that depending on the uh, kind of use case or reason behind your journey, that you actually do need to pull people in from a lot of different sources. So adding different triggers, joining them all to your condition or action shapes is perfectly fine uh, and something that we would encourage in many situations. Now, for our qualification journey here today, I'm taking all of the different methods that people can interact with us. So, for example, uh, website forms, um, webinar attendee lists, and even event registration lists. And I'm triggering those leads into this journey uh, so that they can then start to go through my condition checks. So, as you can see from my canvas, I have three condition checks that I'm using here today to qualify my leads. 
The first is checking whether or not they are a competitor of ours and, and therefore we want to remove them from this lead nurture journey. Uh, the second check I'm doing is to see whether they are already a paying customer. And if they are, we obviously don't want to send them down our lead nurture journey, so we'll remove them at this stage. Uh, and then the last check that I'm doing here is to see whether or not they've submitted a free trial sign-up form in the past. And if they have, uh, likewise, they don't need to fall into that lead nurture journey as they've already completed that ultimate goal of our lead nurture journey. Now, last but not least, if they do meet all of my criteria checks that I've set here on my canvas, I'm going to add them to a list, which I've called my lead nurture journey list. And I'll use this list to then trigger my lead nurture journey in a separate canvas within my autopilot instance. Um, now, don't worry, we are going to get to that journey, so we will take you through how to, uh, to set that up. But for today, I know I've added a lot of shapes on my canvas. Um, some of them you are probably um, more than familiar with already, but I thought it would be useful to take you through now how I've actually configured these shapes within my qualification journey so that should you wish to add the same shapes to your canvas at your end, you can do so after this call. Now, the first shape that I've added is a form submitted shape. Um, we actually went through this shape in quite a lot of detail during our training 101. So uh, if there's any outstanding questions as to how you can capture a form on your website, definitely recommend that you listen to that uh, webinar training 101 in your spare time. Um, we'll also send you a link to it as well after this call so that you have it to hand uh, should it be needed. But for today, all I'm doing is adding that form submission trigger to my canvas and selecting my contact us form from my drop down list because I want to capture those people who have shown interest via my site. The next trigger that I've used is a smart segment trigger, and today I'm using this to look for any contacts who have attended a webinar. Um, we did also go through smart segments during training 101, but um, I'm keen to kind of retake you through that so you can see how easy it is to set up a smart segment and also to take you through the criteria checks that we do here to add people to it. Um, so I'm simply going to click add a new smart segment and let's just call it for the purpose of today uh, attended webinar demo and I'll go ahead and create that. Now the two main pieces of criteria that I'm looking at here to segment my contacts are firstly whether or not they uh, visited a specific page on my website um, and let's for the purpose of today's demo just go with a uh, generic landing page but just to show you what you can do here, so let's say that my sign up form was on um, autopilothq.com forward slash webinar. So this smart segment is first of all going to pick up any contact in my database that actually has visited that page in the past. Um, but so that I know if they attended a webinar off the back of visiting that page, I'm also going to add a secondary criteria check um, to this smart segment which is to see whether or not they attended that webinar. So I have included a custom uh, field within my autopilot account that is called attended webinar. So I'm going to check against that uh, field in my smart segment and I'm looking for anybody who uh, is true that they have attended a webinar. There's a couple of different ways in which you can get this information into autopilot. Uh, kind of the two main ways is to work with um, one of our app connections, such as Zapier, to be able to automatically get this information into your platform. Um, alternatively, if you're uh, doing a more manual approach, you can also update this uh, field against contact records after they've attended one of your webinar sessions. So once you're happy with that criteria, uh, like we are today, you can click Create. And you'll see that that smart segment is now added uh, as a trigger to your journey and then uh, we can configure it to add all contacts in this segment and then any contacts that enter it in future. Third and finally, I've also used a list trigger today. Um, and this list trigger was a manual upload that I did off the back of an event uh, that we hosted last week. I've simply captured everybody that registered uh, to be a part of our mailing list at that event and I'm triggering them straight into this journey. 
Now, the condition checks from here. So the first that I did was to see whether or not anybody triggered into this journey was a competitor. Uh, and the way in which I set that up is I used a smart segment. So again, um, going through that demo I just did for my webinar sign up, the criteria that we set for our competitors in our smart segment was to look at a field value. And that field value for us was the email address. So we would have looked at field value, uh, email address contains, and then entered in the at competitor one, at competitor two email addresses to make sure that we're not uh, targeting anybody that works for a competitor. So as long as they're not on our list of competitors, you can see I've joined it here with a no, they then flow through to the next condition check, um, which is to see whether or not they're a paying customer. To do this, I'm checking against a field that I have. Uh, it's a custom field against every one of my contacts. And it is simply, uh, if they're a paying customer, that field will equal true. So if that field doesn't equal true, then I'm sending them through to my third and final condition check, which is to make sure they haven't submitted a free trial up sign in the past. Um, again, this is just a uh, has submitted form condition check with my trial sign up form selected from my drop down list. And my connection here is, again, if somebody has not submitted this form, they flow through, they qualify uh, through my qualification journey, and they're added to that lead nurture journey list so that they can be triggered into my lead nurture journey. Now, a couple of key points to call out here before I hand back over to Hadley to take you through uh, how you can set up the content and the flow for your lead uh, nurture journey. Um, one is that, Make sure you're keeping your goal in mind at all times when you're building out this qualification journey and refine your qualifications based on that goal. Um, and then the second call out here is that it's likely you'll be constantly adding and refining your qualification steps. You might be adding in new triggers or adding in new conditions to check against. Um, so if you want to create different versions of this journey, you can do that really simply by just duplicating this canvas from the main journeys menu and then going from there and, and calling it maybe lead qualification updated or version two. So two pro tips there to keep in mind, um, but I'm going to hand back over to Hadley now so that she can take you through uh, exactly what this lead nurture journey looks like before we then go into autopilot again and build it out. So before I go ahead and get started on this um, and speaking to more of the content side of things and what we'll actually be sending these contacts moving through, um, really just want to encourage you guys to send through your questions. Um, we're going to get through this next stage, which is, again, going to be a lot of time with an autopilot. Um, so I, I love to think that we're explaining mm -hmm. everything perfectly, but please do uh, go ahead and add those in, and we'll spend some time at the end covering that. So as we think through um, kind of what we need to be sending people and, and where they are, where all these users are within their personal path within the journey, um, we tend to break this out into three kind of potential paths that the users can move through. Um, so we've got an early stage, a mid stage, and then a late stage, or what we've named that call to action, call it, kind of call to action path here. Um, so the indicator we use is more about how are they engaging with that content that we send. Um, so here at Autopilot, we focus on whether a user is clicking or not through those emails um, because it tends to be a little bit more indicative of what is their interest level um, because it does require a bit of active action on the part of that customer. Um, so all of the type of content will be driving these users to take a click so that we can use that as, as kind of the, the traffic cop uh, way to move them throughout the journey. So as you're starting to think through the content that you are going to be sending to these users, I really recommend that you take a step back and think high level to understand what are all the reasons that someone could be coming to your company? You know, what is it that they could be trying to learn? Here at Autopilot, we kind of make the assumption that everyone is just trying to better their marketing in some way. So if you break all of the different reasons that they could be come to us, it all comes into that simple fact, you know, bettering their marketing. Um, so with this in mind, uh, the different paths that they're on, whether it's early stage, mid stage, or late stage, is going to focus on driving them to content that does help them better their marketing in some way. Um, and then how they how they engage is going to change what type of content that we send them. So if we look at the journey and the way that we've built it, 
we've got this early stage top of funnel content. This is very focused on really high level and educational style content, all about um, different ways that they can better their marketing initiatives, whether it's through different lead nurturing strategies, different landing page builders that they can use, you know, overall marketing best practices. Um, you'll notice that Autopilot isn't really the main focus of these emails. It's about showing our voice and, and telling them that we're a source of truth that they can use um, to really help build a stronger marketing program overall. So it's, it's another way to engage with those users. Um, the users that don't click will stay on this path. You'll notice that there's a longer cadence between the different emails, um, so we're not engaging and touching with them too often. Um, we're sticking with our, our, our goal and what we've seen of, of staying top of mind by emailing people about every two to four weeks. Um, and then if they do click, we're moving them into an accelerated path, uh, which is engaging with them a bit more, a, a bit more quickly. So this is that mid-stage. Um, those that are in the middle of the funnel, we want to speak to the value of our company through past webinars. Um, customer proof points become really important here. Um, but we're still not really sending the message that, you know, you must use autopilot. You know, we're just casually starting to bring autopilot into part of that conversation of how they can leverage us and how we can help them to improve, uh, improve their business. If they don't engage through that path, we're actually just going to push them back up into that early stage top of funnel content because they haven't shown us that they're ready to continue learning more about autopilot. Um, they seem to be more focused on um, maybe just, you know, kind of going through our journey as it stands, um, but they're maybe not giving us that interest level that we need to show that they're, uh, that they're, that they're active and, and potentially a, a someone we'd want to drive towards a free trial. For those that do click, they're going into that call to action path that I mentioned earlier. So this is what we call the late stage. Um, it's all about ways that we want to actually drive them to the conversion that's the most important to us. So, you know, sitting back and, and thinking through what Eloise said about the goal, you know, what is the goal of this journey that we're creating? If we look at the autopilot nurture machine, that goal is creating a free trial. So we want those users that have come to us in some way to sign up for a free trial so that we can, you know, get them on the line and work with them and, and show you how, uh, show them how autopilot can really impact and improve their business. Um, so this is the point where we are starting to engage with them and, and drive them towards that conversion metric. So this is much more about, hey, you know, this is what we actually want them to do. There's not a lot of white noise around, you know, what is marketing or what is this perspective. It's just, hey, this is what we're here for. Let us help you. If they don't engage again, they'll be dropped uh, dropped back in, and you'll notice that we change some of the content that we send um, later. So it, we actually have a personal touch from a member of our sales team, um, driving them to a group demo that we do on the sales side as well, um, so that they can you know see autopilot in action. Because at that point, um, they haven't actually signed up for the free trial in their own accord. So maybe they want to get a, a little bit of a, a sense of who we are, and you know a really low impact way to do that. Uh, is by joining the sales webinar um, versus the one with us where, you know, we we, uh, we want you guys to actually build some journeys. <laughs> okay, so really quickly just wanted to kind of go into some of the, the email pro tips. So you'll notice that we're using, uh, within that last screen that I showed you guys, um, we're using a lot of the same style template. So it's not a really complicated template. Um, because the goal of these emails is not for users to spend too much time actually reading their email. Um, the goal is for these users to show engagement and click through. So um, we're really trying to drive them towards that call to action. Uh, we use a lot of our existing blog articles um, or other relevant webinars that we've done or partner pieces um, that we've created in the past so that we can really easily fit them into the framework of this lead nurturing, um, in this lead nurturing template that we've created. So you can see we offer a benefit statement to catch the reader's eye. Um, we have an interesting image. Uh, and then we also have a, a quick and relevant hook uh, with a call to action to drive interest from that prospect. Um, and I really recommend remembering that the version that you create to start doesn't have to be that final version. So you can A-B test and see you know, what subject line performs the best. 
is the blog article or the piece of content that you picked uh, really the one that they're most interested in? If it's not inciting a lot of engagement, you know, maybe it's time to rethink a, a, another type of content to leverage. Um, so uh, really recommend testing these and, and playing with what's going to work best for your base um, and the people that you have moving through this journey. So we do actually offer this template with an autopilot, and I say that because it will really help you easily get up and running. Um, you can enter in your branding. It's fully mobily responsive, um, and we'll include uh, in our follow-up also some other ideas of how you can leverage content that you guys already have to help build out this journey, um, because you shouldn't think of that as a limiting factor, because there's always uh, a lot more available than you think uh, when you think when you initially look at how much content we've got in there. So I'm going to give the floor back to Eloise so he can jump into autopilot, uh, and she's going to help us build out that early, mid, uh, and late stage path that we kind of went through in the in the PowerPoint slide. Awesome. Yeah, it looks so nice when you show it on that slide and all the content there and all the pictures. Um, so I'm afraid I'm going to do more of the operational side of things, but um, I'm going to actually show you how you can build that journey. So the content pieces that Hadley's just taking you through will fit into the emails. Um, but I want to now show you sort of how you join up all of those emails. Um, so that's the first thing here that we've added to our list of uh, what you'll be taken through is how do you build the journey? And then from there, how do you go about progressing contacts down different journey paths to Hadley's earlier point for, you know, top, middle, and bottom of the funnel based on their engagement, which today we're taking you through as a, a click on that email. Um, and then third and final, what happens when somebody actually completes the goal of that journey? So for us, it would be to sign up for a free trial. Um, I want to show you how you can remove them really easily from the journey so that you're not targeting to those people who have already completed what you've asked them to do. So let's jump back into autopilot. So as you start getting her screen up and running again, guys, going to keep harping on this. <laughs> add in your questions um, so that we can make sure we get these answered. I think uh, what Eloise is about to cover might help prompt some, but, but please, yeah. please do send those through. Now, I have a feeling there'll be questions at this day. So <laughs> fingers crossed, because we love questions. Um, all right, so jumping back into the platform now, um, I'm going to take you through the motions of creating a life cycle nurture journey. Uh, keep in mind as we go through this, that ultimate goal that we're targeting here through our lead nurture journey, which is to encourage those people that we qualified earlier in our qualification journey to sign up for a free trial uh, and become hopefully a, a paying customer of Autopilot. So the first thing you're going to want to do when creating your lead nurture journey is to add a trigger to your canvas. Um, now, because I ended my qualification journey earlier with an add to list action, I've started my life cycle nurture journey or my lead nurture journey, sorry, um, with a corresponding list trigger that you can see here. And I selected my lead nurture journey from my drop down. And I've also selected this third option when configuring, which is to add all contacts that are currently on that list and then any contacts that are added to it in future. And the reason I kind of keep stopping at this point is that in order for you to set this up as a machine that's automatically working in the back end, you do really want to make sure that this first trigger is configured properly to not only add people that are on that list now, but to keep adding people to it in future who are added to the list through my qualification journey. So that's why that third option there is, is kind of so important to starting these, uh, these automatically constantly running journeys. Now, once I've triggered my contacts into the journey, I then am going to do three things. So the first is that I'm going to add them into an initial delay of one day so that there's a bit of a buffer between how they interacted with my site or my marketing materials at the beginning of my qualification journey and then receiving that kind of first communication piece from me on my lead nurture journey. So after a day, I'm going to release those contacts and shoot them into the send email shape so that they get that first email from us, um, which is, I've called here my lead nurture email one. Um, but to Hadley's earlier point when she showed you those uh, beautiful screenshots of our emails, uh, this is more of that sort of high level educational piece um, that's designed for autopilot to kind of hook people in by uh, telling them how they can better their marketing initiatives. 
Now, after we've sent them that first email, we're then going to want to give them um, a delay, and I've added in five days here. And what we're doing by giving them that delay is allowing them enough time to see that email in their inbox, open it, and hopefully, uh, for us, click on a link within that email so that they're taken to our site or our marketing materials so that they can learn a bit more and show us their engagement. Now, a couple of quick pro tips here before we get into shooting people down different uh, funnels within this journey. The first is, as many of you may or may not know, um, we do actually offer you an additional uh, function here on the ad delay, which is to enable a time and day window. Now, where this becomes really useful is if you want to send an email out to your contacts on a particular day of the week or between a particular time. So here you can see that when we enable that time and day window, as an automatic setup, Autopilot pushes uh, the business days and business working hours uh, into your configuration window here. So we've got this email going out between 9 and 5.30 on Monday to Friday. And then also selecting our time zone, which would be uh, the LA time zone for us here in San Francisco. Let's say you only wanted this email to go out on a Tuesday. Uh, you can configure all of that within this window as well as your times. Uh, so it's a really powerful tool if you're looking to schedule emails to go out at a specific time or on a specific day. Now my second pro tip here is um, Hadley mentioned that we do have a template within Autopilot that you can use to um, start creating these lead nurture emails. So I just want to show you exactly where you can find that, um, so that if it is something that you're keen to utilize after this call, you can go away and, and kind of do that immediately. Um, so when configuring your email shape, you'll want to select new email, and then go to the pick a template option for us. Just give it a quick name so I can get on to the next step. Now, from the six templates that we provide you today, the uh, template that we have been speaking through uh, as we've taken you through the content around this lead nurture journey is a single article. So let me just quickly show you what that looks like. Um, to Hadley's earlier point, there's kind of three key pieces to this single article um, and reasons why it doesn't need to be this huge content piece that's a blocker to getting this journey live. The three pieces for us are really uh, a nice, big, engaging image that's designed to sort of capture that uh, user from the first moment that they open this email in their inbox. Um, the second key piece is an engaging uh, headline and then also a byline underneath it or paragraph of copy. Again, it doesn't need to be big. Uh, it's just designed here to kind of pique their interest and get them to click on the call to action, which is kind of the third uh, important piece to this email setup, and this call to action will direct people through to your site, um, and through this, this click here on this email will also then be able to funnel them down to the middle of the funnel, uh, because we know that they're clearly engaged if they're clicking on our email. Great, okay, so now that we've given our contacts that five day delay to see our email, open it, and hopefully click, I'm then going to send people down different journey paths based on their engagement. Uh, and to Hadley's earlier point, the engagement that we're looking for here for a lead nurture journey is whether or not they've clicked on a link within our email. Um, now, we have actually tested this over the years. We've tested opens versus clicks and sort of what shows that higher level of engagement and really what should uh, determine which journey path that people go down. And we have found that um, sending people down a path based on whether or not they've clicked as opposed to open is uh, definitely the most beneficial for us because a click shows that higher engagement um, and also that intent as well to find out more about us. So that is here at Autopilot what we base our, uh, our funneling on is that click within an email. Now, from here, I essentially have two groups of people. One is that group of people who haven't clicked um, on my higher level educational email. So I'm going to send them up to the top of the funnel um, where they'll continue to progress through at a longer cadence. So here we've built in a 10-day cadence for them, five days to see that email, and then after we checked, if they haven't clicked, another five days before we send them the second. Um, if they have clicked on that email and they have engaged with us, we're going to send them down into the middle of the funnel and we're going to send them an email straight away. So we're reducing that communication uh, cadence from 10 days at the top of the funnel to five 
days initially at the bottom and then an initial three after that uh, second email. So you can see here how we are reducing it. Um, for you and for, as a best practice guide, think about your sales cycle when you're determining the delay for top, middle and bottom of the funnel. Um, for us, we found that 10 days was a, a good delay at the top of the funnel, but you'll really want to look at your unsubscribe rates uh, to kind of optimize and, and do some A-B testing for that as well uh, to determine the best cadence for you depending on your sales cycle. Now you'll see here that uh, as we have that on-click versus not uh, no-click engagement model that we're then just going to repeat this for the rest of our journey. Uh, and send people down the different funnel uh, levels, so top, middle, and bottom, depending on whether they have clicked or they haven't clicked. Uh, to Hadley's point again, if they haven't clicked, remember that people can go up a level and down a level in the funnel. So if they're at the middle of the funnel and they don't click on that middle of the funnel content, we're going to use a has not clicked connection to send them back up to the top of the funnel, and if they have clicked, back down to the bottom. So you can see how that's repeated uh, throughout our journey, sending people up and down depending on their engagement, which we have uh, uh, looked at through their clicks on our links. Now to uh, the kind of second point around this journey, which is what happens if somebody is you know, midway through the funnel and they're actually super engaged and they sign up for a free trial, so there's not really a need for us to send them any more of this uh, lead nurture content. So the answer to that is we build a parallel ejection journey on our canvas using the eject from journey shape. Now, because the eject from journey shape is canvas wide, it does let you build in this parallel journey that doesn't have to be connected, as it were, to the initial journey. Um, one thing to keep in mind when you are building out this eject from journey uh, journey on your on your canvas is that it does have to start with a trigger shape, as with any uh, autopilot journey. So I would encourage you to think about the action that a contact would have to take to show you that they have completed the goal. For us, the goal of our lead nurture journey is for somebody to sign up on our website for a free trial. So I'm using that trial sign up form submission as my parallel uh, trigger for my ejection journey. Any time that a contact who is in this journey submits a form, they'll be triggered into my ejection. I then want to make sure that they actually are on my canvas uh, because this form submitted is going to trigger any time somebody submits the form. So to do that, I use the condition check. Again, I'm just looking to make sure that they're on that initial list that I started my lead nurture journey with, which is my lead nurture journey list. From there, this is more of a pro tip, adding in this add to list shape. Um, and the reason I encourage people to add those that they're ejecting to a list is so that you can keep a, a running record of everybody that you've ejected from the journey. Once you've added them to this ejected list, you can then go ahead and inject and eject them from the canvas. Um, now the key pro tip here is that as soon as anybody enters this eject from journey shape, they'll be immediately removed from the canvas. So you want to make sure that all of these actions, such as the add to list, happens before they hit this shape. Um, had you added the add to list after you'd ejected them, nobody would make it through to this shape because they'd be immediately removed at the eject from journey shape. So that's just one thing to bear in mind when building out an ejection journey is make sure this is the last shape in your journey as people will be immediately removed. So that's pretty much it from my end in terms of a, a building thing. Um, but I guess one thing to keep in mind when you are building out your lead nurture journey is that um, it can be as small or as big as you like it. Uh, to make it bigger, you can see we've got quite a small one on our canvas today. Uh, to make it bigger, you would just simply need to keep copying over um, this uh, path here, moving people up and down depending on the amount of content you have. And then the other kind of pro tip for those of you that are uh, more advanced and looking for additional ways to optimize towards the bottom of the funnel, um, don't forget you can also add in other communication touch points like the heads up message, for example, if somebody clicks on an email towards the bottom of your funnel, you could always then show them a heads up message on your site. So what happens? Uh, when you want to look at how this journey is performing and uh, how you can make optimizations? Well, that is a very good question. And for that, I am going to hand back to Hadley.
Awesome. And one thing here, guys, as well, if you notice, there's a link to our guidebook in the upper mm -hmm. left-hand corner. Um, we do that. have a, a guide that we're in the process of updating it that's based on this, but it will be uh, available shortly, but it will be the turning paying customers uh, into, or strangers into paying customers yep. guide. So uh, you will see that there, and it's basically everything that Eloise just showed you uh, built out already. So all you need to do is plug in the assets that are unique to your business, uh, add those in, and you can go ahead and publish. So I uh, just wanted to let you know that we have a way for you to quickly get started, and we just revamped it, which is why it's it. not available today, but will be available uh, most likely before the end of the day. And I'm, I'm hovering over that guidebook link here now in my screen so you can see exactly how to access that. Awesome. So back over to you, Hadley. Okay. So defining success. So the journey's built, it's live, it's, it's running for us, now what? So as one of my colleagues once said, uh, the journey never ends. So we want to really look at how this journey is performing for us uh, and optimize it over time to make sure we're getting the best results here. Um, so this all ties back to that initial conversation and initial point that both Eloise and I have made. Um, it's just so important to really define what's important to your company and what's important uh, and what's that goal that you're driving towards so that everything, uh, we know to, what to measure, we know what to look for, and we can really truly understand the success of this business or of this journey, um, as well as you know, make sure that we have that appropriate tracking in place um, to measure the metrics that are the most valuable to you. So it all comes back to um, getting that goal defined really early on. Eloise alluded to this when she was going through the journey, but one of the major metrics, no matter what is important to you, is to watch that unsubscribe rate. And the reason is, is because we want to make sure that we're providing value to these end users at the cadence that makes the most sense. Um, so we want to keep this rate below about 1%. If it gets higher than that, then the cadence is just isn't right and we need to adjust it accordingly because uh, we're just uh, overreaching out to these users and it's not helping us get where we want to go. Um, but there are a couple different kind of measurements that we've seen that can be really important or that we care about on our end. Uh, so I just wanted to outline some different ways that you can think through what's important here. Um, so for those of you that are interested in more about, you know, the awareness and, and getting people to recognize your brand, you know, how are these activities driving the overall success of your particular service? Are you seeing a lot of social media engagements out there? Um, is word of mouth a source? This is where UTM parameters can really be used to help track the impact um, to see you know, how people are, are getting to your pages. And for those that, that just aren't familiar with UTM parameters, um, these are just some initial kind of variables that you can add to the end of the URL um, that helps you take the links that you're generating through you know, Facebook or your, the same landing page that you've got and then you're driving traffic from all these different sources um, and helps you understand kind of where that, tra that uh, traffic's coming from. For content and engagement, uh, this you can see really easily with an autopilot, you know, how many people are opening and clicking these emails. Um, you'll notice that there tends to be a trend of people that are in that mid and late stage tier um, of them having a little bit more engagement, which, which does make sense because these are the people that have shown that they're interested and they're engaged uh, and they are moving through with those accelerators. Um, for lead generation, you know, how many monthly qualified leads are you generating through Nurture? What's the quality of these leads? And what percentage of these come back within 12 months? Because you really want to think of focus and, and focus on building out that sales pipeline for your team. Uh, and then conversion and revenue, you know, are sales being generated? How long does it take to sell? Uh, you'll be able to see the results in how long it takes for the sales cycle to close. We can hopefully improve upon that because you're getting more educated leads coming in. Um, what is the average sales price of those that are in nurture versus not? Uh, and also, what is the average lifetime value of your customers? Um, and that can be done, again, in nurture versus not. Um, so the important thing is for all of these and for whatever you care about um, is to, again, really define that goal when you're creating this journey make sure what's important to you is, is getting tracked in some way, that your content supports that goal, the journey supports that goal, um, so that we can really drive and, and get that value for your team and, and really help to uh, have this nurture machine working for you and, and, and working for your team. So we promised you guys time for questions, so this is the time when we are going to open up those lines and uh, tackle some of those. 
Um, so we'll go ahead and get started now. Please do again use that chat window so that we can uh, go ahead and answer them and, and get as many of these questions answered as we can. So we're going to open it up. It looks like we've got one question so far um, from Brian, which is fantastic. And the question here is, um, when would you use a smart segment trigger as opposed to a standard list trigger? Um, and kind of just as a bit of background for everyone, and, and Brian, I hope you don't mind me sharing this with uh, those that are on the line, but Brian's looking to create a uh, lead nurture journey here for all existing clients, including any new clients that get added to the list. So perfect. So this is where using the static list can be really valuable because you can use it kind of operationally to add and remove people, and you can kind of think of it as a as a tag that you can manually set when you're moving people through these different journeys. The difference is with smart segments that you're actually creating a profile of who that user is. So it's looking for specific fields and criteria. Um, that they need to meet in, in order to be added. So it just depends on how you're passing the information over to autopilot and what's going to make the most sense there. Because um, like Eloise mentioned earlier, you know, there's different apps that you can connect, there's different sources, you can have different form submissions. So it just depends on, on all the different ways that you have people coming in that you might want to add them in uh, to that longer term nurture journey. We choose a static list because we're constantly adding new triggers um, so we don't want to have to keep updating that smart segment to look for different criteria. We just want to be able to, to easily add in all those new triggers and sources into our operational journey um, so that we can you know, put them through that process and get them to that list. Um, so that's kind of our thought process there for, for why we structured it this way. Yeah, and the key thing to note, um, Brian, is that if you are going to be using a list uh, trigger, lists are static. So you would have to have that operational journey set up uh, prior to your lead nurture journey so that you can automatically add people to that list through a qualification. Um, if you're not going to do a qualification journey, then I think we would probably recommend using a smart segment. Um, and to do that, you would just need to make sure you had a field uh, against all of your contacts to say whether or not they're existing clients. And then you could build a smart segment to look for uh, whether or not that field equals true. So it just depends whether or not you're going to create a qualification journey. If you are, recommend that everybody that qualifies through that journey gets added to a list and you use that list as your trigger for your lead nurture. Uh, if you're not going to do a qualification journey, then the best way to automate this is to uh, probably use a smart segment as long as you have that field. So apparently Eloise and I have done such an amazing job at answering all of the questions here. We'll go ahead and give everyone um, a, another minute or so so we can make sure that we get as many of these answered. Um, so we'll just, we'll just uh, hang tight for a moment and, and let people type in any other questions that they have. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, we really appreciate your time. We both wish, wish you all a very Merry Holiday. I know we've caught you just at the end of, uh, or just before the holiday break, but just very much appreciate it. And we wish you uh, all the best for the end of 2016. And we look forward to working with you guys more in 2017. And uh, we will follow up with you guys with some more materials around the life cycle nurture. But, but thank you again and happy 2017. Yeah, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Talk to you in uh, the new year. Cheers.